So today I am joined by Joe. He is a senior product specialist at OptiClass. So this is, this, Joe is, is on the team at OptiClass and this is the first chance that we're getting to introduce him to the group. So uh, Joe, why don't you say hello and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, good. hello everybody. Um, as Chris pointed out, my name is Joe. I'm part of the uh, the sales team. I've been with Off to Class um, since April of last year, and um, yeah, super excited to be part of the group. And uh, I basically, for in terms of what is my role at the company, I um, you know Off to Class is uh, is used obviously by all of you wonderful teachers. Um, to grow your own businesses, um, but off to classes also, also serves institutions. So if you happen to be teachers that work at schools, universities, uh, adult debt centers, whatever it may be, um, yeah. So they, I work with uh, those institutions in in trying to figure out um, if what we have to offer will be of uh, service to them, and then yeah, uh, kind of getting them getting the institution um, using OptiClass uh, to help their students. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, and Joe, wh where are you? Oh, I, I am based out of uh, Toronto, Canada. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so Joe is in Toronto with the, with the most of the team. I'm in, I'm in Florida. Um, and um, so I, I think it's great to have the opportunity to bring other team mm -hmm. members into the group from time to time just to, to be to give them a chance to say hello to everyone and to introduce uh, them mm -hmm. to the group. So um, you kind of answered my next question already, which is about off to class and why why is there a salesperson on the off to class team, right? Um, yeah, so a, a lot of the people that use off to class use off to class individually. Schools also can use off to class. Um, mm -hmm by using multiple teacher accounts. And, and they, there are some other features that allow them to work with larger numbers of teachers and students. And mm -hmm. that, that is what Joe does. So Joe, just uh, wh what is, just really briefly, mm -hmm. tell me about like, what is like a day in the life of your job of like a, a product specialist doing, doing enterprise sales at Off the Class? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the perks of being in a sales team is that there is no like every day looks different but typically um my day usually consists of um having conversations with uh we would say let's say potential customers we they're not customers yet potential customers and bringing them into a conversation about basically spending the first bit Kind of understanding what is their uh, what is their uh, current situation and uh, kind of basically that the earlier part of the conversation becomes more about diagnosing a potential problem a challenge sure. that they may be having yeah. um, and then tying that to the solution we have and so most of my day usually uh, is filled with um, presentations uh, conversations with school districts. Um, in the U.S. and around the world, um, you know, universities, um, basically yeah, any institution that teaches um, teaches uh, English as a second language, um, and uh, and and it could be early conversations, it could be you know follow up conversations, uh, maybe after the uh, the solution has been introduced to the team, like getting feedback, kind of what mm -hmm. they think, and kind of um, yeah, like talking about different. Uh, talking about the implementation process as well, because when you're, it's very different when you're, when as a teacher I'm signing up for a premium account and I'm just getting started, um, that is, that process is, um, becomes a lot more complex when you have multiple parties involved. Sure. Uh, so having those conversations as well with our, um, you know, customer success team that works with those institutions as well. Okay, and what are you here to, to talk about today? Yeah, um, so a few um, internally, uh, company wide, we we host workshops, internal workshops, where you know each employee gets to present on something that you know could be could be related to their uh, business unit, um, or could be just a passion of theirs. And uh, yeah, I, I I was thrown into this world of sales about eighteen months ago, basically when I started it off to class, and uh, my my perception of uh, of sales and what sales entails was completely 
I held like a lot of other people, I'm guessing held have myths around sales and what it takes to be in sales or what is what is the world of sales like. Mm -hmm. And in the last 18 months, um, all of those a lot of those myths um, have have been busted. Um, And I kind of wanted to share that with the group. and and kind of you know hopefully um, not here to convince you or not here to um, prove that what you what you have been thinking about sales is wrong, but to kind of basically present you different perspectives and how this could potentially help you accelerate your uh, you know teaching business. Perfect. Okay. So so basically, this is going to be clarifying misunderstandings that are commonly held about sales. Um, based mm. on your your experience at in your role uh, as where you were a salesperson for the first time, so you are not some mm-hmm. career, career salesperson. Have done no. a bunch of training. You know, you no. came in to your role at Off to Class with a lot of misconceptions about what sales was. Um, and yes, so, what, exactly. what you're going to share now is basically your journey on mm-hmm. learning what sales really is. Mm-hmm. And and in our conversation, we're going to talk about how those same principles can apply yeah. to online English teaching. That sounds fantastic. Precisely. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. Okay, great. So we are going to turn on um, yes. your your screen share. Great. And in fact, let me. It's showing it's showing two things really quick. So I think what I want to do is I want to make I want to make a quick adjustment. Let me see if I can do it while we are. <laughs> While we're working, okay, got it. Okay, great. So here we are. Um, here's Miss to Bus Sales Edition, a presentation by Joe. Okay, so let's get started. Yes. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a visual representation of different sales from different perspectives, and and maybe some of you can relate to it. This is I. This definitely resonates with me. Is kind of an an idea of what my friends think I do when I tell them that I work in sales. What my parents think I do. Um, what society and maybe a lot of you um, f- think that sales entails. Um, prospects are people that um, aren't clients yet. Um, so um, when we reach out to them, this is what they f- feel like. Um, this is what a salesperson does. Um, what I feel I do is mostly doing presentations, but what I end up actually doing is just you know trying to figure out uh, maybe it could be a multitude of things, tr- strategies, you know, how can I add value? But yeah, this is kind of a visual representation of what the different sales from different perspectives. Yeah. And a lot of follow up is what I see happening in that bottom. Yeah, of right, image. <laughs> yeah exactly. A lot of kind of, yeah. And this is just, I'm a big Office fan and Office has great memes. And this is, this is kind of a, a funny, uh, satirical uh, thing of what sales is is that you just basically what people feel that what sales entails is you just go in there with a pitch and then you just wait and you twist their hands until the until the prospect you know says okay fine I'm in yeah. and and that's kind of a, a, a like a poking fun at it is, is what people think sales uh, entails but not really sure no. um so yeah we're kind of well let's jump right into uh, talking about the first myth is, um, I think the vis- the picture will kind of uh, give the representation is you need to be able to sell anything to anyone. So we have the, in English, we have a very you know old adage, old saying is, you know, to be a good salesman, you need to be able to sell ice to an Eskimo. Um, and um, and that's basically the the core idea of that is you need to be able to sell anything to anyone. And uh, yeah, uh, we can uh, kind of move on to the next slide. So this kind of stems from the idea that back in the days, so this is pre-internet, um, that the idea was that sellers had were in when in control of all the information. So that's where it generated the idea, the perception of the sleazy car salesperson, right? Because you would go to maybe, I mean, you know, depending on how old you are, uh, I'm guessing most of us. Have, we're alive pre-internet and where access to information was sparse and you would have to go to, let's say, if you wanted to buy a car, you would have to go to a car salesperson because you didn't know anything about cars unless you were a car expert. Um, and basically, the car salesperson was in charge of the, all the information. So they would tell you, give you the information and you had no 
way to verify it. And so you would have to basically take them for their for their word. And so that kind of generated the perception of like um, sellers were in control of the information and they could tell you anything and you would basically believe it even if it's a lie. Yeah, this this I, I want to just pop in here because this yeah. I think is, is super important. Um, a lot of teachers don't like the idea of selling. And the reason that teachers don't like the idea of selling is because this is the image that it conjures mm -hmm. in, in people's heads. What, when I think of sales, I think of a used car salesman, right? The sleazy used car mm -hmm. salesman. And, and mm -hmm. here, this is, I think, probably the core problem of, of looking at sales <laughs> this way, especially mm -hmm. for an online teacher, is that mm -hmm. this paradigm of the sleazy salesperson is based on an assumption that the salesperson wants to trick you. It's based exactly. on an assumption that the salesperson has a product that's not good, a car that is has mechanical problems that they are looking to to trick you into buying. And or so, maybe the salesperson is there to put you in a you know like is only they're only looking at for their interest. Um, right. It's, it's it's not a win-win situation. Exactly. It's, it, yes. It's you are they're there to basically, uh, you know, meet their, get their bottom line, hit their quota yep. at the expense of you being out of Absolutely. Know, money. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a winner and a loser in that exactly. interaction. And, exactly. and, and when the salesman gets someone to, to agree to buy, then they win, but the customer is the loser. And teachers say, I don't want to do that. Of course you don't want to do that because no. you, you don't want to, to make students a loser you're not sure because you don't want to trick them. Exactly. So my my first thought, and I know we're going to get go into this. My mm -hmm. first thought is that if you're a teacher and this is your attitude and yeah. that you're trying to trick students, then you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be teaching. Right. <laughs> I'm assuming that for 99 percent of teachers, this is not your attitude. Um, yeah. And so to. So, most negative feelings of sales are based on this faulty assumption. The faulty assumption being the salesman is there to trick, the salesman mm -hmm. is there to to win um, yeah. versus versus the customer lose. So what what one of the key things is in looking at sales in a more positive way is to question those underlying assumptions and what can we replace that with? What does that myth get replaced with? Um, that is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we have a comment. Someone says that sometimes teachers think that selling their courses undermines the fact that they teach to help people. Teachers help people, but there should be no shame in asking for the right price. Absolutely, yeah, no, absolutely. And then we'll kind of get into more about that in terms of like the value. And okay. then we'll kind of, this will be covered in uh, later right. as, as we, we get around to busting the myth, but that's okay. a great point. Perfect. And so yeah, that's, so life post internet. So internet, it has obviously revolutionized um, you know, best. I mean, after class would not exist if there was no internet. Um, and and um, one of the biggest advantages uh, of the internet, from the buyer's perspective, is the the democracy of information, where um, is basically every buyer is a buyer has as much power in terms of access to information um, as a seller. So a buyer can access the info easily, the buyer can verify the info easily, and the buyer also has tons of choices. So what that means is we can we can move on to the next slide. What that means from the, um, the truth is that from a seller perspective, um, you need to ask first, and then you need to put position your product later. So what that means is you are only there as a salesperson. My job is to find out what are your needs? What is it that you what is a problem that you're trying to solve? And then come in from a position of a consultant and uh, meaning that um, after you tell me after we're able to diagnose your problem, diagnose just the, the, the challenge that you're facing, then uh, basically um, educate on what uh, educate you on potential solution, give you, you know, basically consult you on potential solutions, and then uh, tie that um, solution to um, tie your solution to um, 
to uh, tie your solution to being able to solve the problem. And what is super crucial in this is because buyers have access to so much information and buyers have done so much research is um, there's no really there's not really an opportunity um, for the salesperson to manipulate or dupe the customer into, you know, uh, into buying something that they don't need. Uh, because if they do that, then there goes their repeat business. The customer will go out there and leave a review and nobody will ever buy from you ever again. So that's one kind of a, a way that uh, a buyer can guard themselves. The second thing is from a sales perspective, um, the awareness that um, you don't want to sell. The myth being that you need to be able to sell anything to anyone. You don't really want to do that. And, and what happens as a result of that is you also need to be able to, uh, if you're finding that what the needs of the customer, um, you can't solve that, you can walk away from it. And, and that actually works well for you. And that also works well for the customer. So then it becomes a win-win situation. Um, and uh, that's kind of the kind of the new reality of, of the sale, the dynamic, the new dynamic of sales and customer relationships. Yeah, one one way that I like to think about it is it, instead of a, making it like of a dynamic mm -hmm. that where it's like the paradigm that we think of as like a car salesperson, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. like to think about it like it, like going to a doctor. Okay, um, the doctor can mm -hmm. sell can sell you a, a treatment, but yeah. but we don't think of the doctor as a salesperson. Right. At right. least ho hopefully we don't a good doctor. Right. At least a good doctor. Yeah. Um, we think of the doctor as someone who says, OK, before the doctor makes the decision on on what they're going to sell you, the first mm -hmm. thing they need to do is to think they need to they need to examine. you. So the yep. doctor has to examine you first and say, and say, oh, well, well, here's the treatment, because if you go to a doctor, you're not necessarily going to get treatment from that doctor. The doctor may do their exam. And then mm. they may say, well, I need to refer you to the specialist, right? Exactly. Who, who can, mm -hmm. who is, has a specific skill set for this specific thing, the reason that you came. Um, yeah. uh, that's what happens a lot of times. Sometimes the doctor may say, oh, okay, well, I can treat you. And then this is what it looks like. But do you, the doctor says, again, good doctor, do you have questions about it, right? Like the, mm -hmm. it, it's there as like a collaboration. It's not, exactly. it's not there so that they can win by getting your money. And then you yeah. are tricked by getting, you know, a, you walk out of there with a bottle of pills that, that don't actually do anything, right? Like, like to, that's what the analogy would look like if we were continuing with the analogy of the car salesman, right? Um, Absolutely. So I as think, teachers, yeah, the, the new reality help. is that it is the relationship between a salesperson as a customer is it's, it's no longer kind of a versus, you know, like sales versus customer. It's more along, um, more it's more a, a partnership absolutely uh and uh, and yeah we can we can kind of move ahead with these okay. slides yeah let's Just do for it. technical purposes we'll move ahead yeah um but yeah basically what what this this kind of these slides talk about is is this again this this idea of of um you know sell me this pen yeah. Um, you know, like being able to sell anything to anyone. It's like, well, maybe I don't need a pen. Maybe I'm happy with a pencil. Uh, or, <laughs> or I don't even write anymore. Uh, right. I, I, I do most of my writing on computers. So I don't even need a pen. And, yeah, and this, so, yeah, this image, right, this Wolf of Wall Street, this is like yeah. the, the quintessential, right? Like you're trying to take advantage of a customer, right? This exactly, is, yeah. Um, it doesn't it, matter exactly what they need. Right. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, and I think what's interesting here is it, it, it may happen, but what's, what's empowering from a customer perspective or when it comes to teachers from a student's perspective is it's not, that business model is no longer sustainable. Yeah. Um, so that's why those archaic uh, ways of doing things may still exist, but they are not the ones that are, um, that are you know, the most successful in, 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 in the space. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so let's skip the video. Yep. We will skip the video. Uh, definitely. And so yeah, just in summary that our, you know, prior from, from our past experiences is, you know, we used to think 
that yeah, to be successful in sales, you need to be able to sell anything to anyone. You need to be able to you know, sell ice to an Eskimo. But actually, the reality is that you, as a salesperson, you need to find out what is it that your customers want, what is their need, and then only position your solution if it serves their needs. Yeah. So to apply this really specifically to online teachers, mm -hmm. I think of this kind of in a couple of ways. Number one, I think of it if, if there's an online teacher who um, has a certain specialization and encounters mm -hmm. a student who's outside that specialization. So Joe, you gave a really good example with young learners. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so like for example, I um, apart from working at Off to Class, um, I also teach um, using Off to Class, um, just like a lot of you in the group, and I specialize in working with adults. Um, and what happens often is, you know, adults, especially adults that have families, may also have children um, that you know for whom English is a second language as well. And so when the adults have, you know, they have hopefully an enjoyable experience working with me. Um, and they say, oh, Joe, like, you're amazing. Um, would you mind um, tutoring my, my, my child? And, um, you know, I could, I could say, yeah, sure. I mean, that's extra money for me, absolutely. But that's not really the solution I offer. Um, my solution is geared specifically for adults. So in that case, um, you know, I, I will happily, kind of like your doctor example, is I will then refer them to you know some of my friends who specialize in working with um, kids, um, or maybe I will ask them to you know <laughs> go look for teachers in this Facebook group, or I will refer them to off to class in the teacher community to to find uh, somebody that works with kids. Um, yeah, so it's it's like you basically want to find out what is it that they want, and yeah. only offer their solution if it you know if it serves their needs. Yeah. And then I think the other part of this, this idea of only offering your solution if it fits their needs, is I think of this idea of tailoring your solution mm. to how really highlight how what you do fits them. So, so everybody wants a custom solution. You know, and, and there's this dynamic that plays out sometimes where we don't want to pay for features we're not going to use. And this applies to products and it applies to services. So we, exactly. we want the things that are really tailored specifically just for us. But if mm -hmm. it has a bunch of bells and whistles that, don't, that I feel like maybe this as a customer isn't going to apply to me, it's going to mm -hmm. make the product or service that I'm looking at seem less appealing. So yep. one, one thing that's also that gets into when you're having a conversation with a potential student is making sure that when you talk about what you do as a teacher, these are mm -hmm. the things that, that your student has a real need for. And you know, if, if there are other things that you do, um, like if, if the student says, I don't really, I feel pretty good about my writing, you know, then, then you don't want to say, I'm really good at helping you with writing and we're going to look at your text and because the student's like, well, I didn't really say if I'm a, a need of mine. <laughs> so not only is it, is it feeling mm. conf confident in your solution, um, but yeah. also making sure that the part of your solution that you share is yeah. the things that your students really need. Exactly. So in that in that previous model, what you shared would be is that a, a, like people would assume that you need to be a successful salesperson. You need to be sell. You need to be able to sell. Uh, basically, convince or twist the student's hand into buying your writing services. Right. But that's not right. what they need. That's they right. only, uh, you know, they only need your help with, I don't know, like reading and speaking, for example. So, and, yeah. and you can say, you know what? No, yeah, that's, and so you only present to them your reading and speaking solutions because they don't need writing. Um, so it's, yeah, that's basically what we're getting at here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do the next one. Myth two. Yes. Um, so the second common myth that I had, and I, sense that a lot of people may have is you have to be an extrovert to be good at sales and and so just for people if you're not familiar with the idea and we can kind of move on to uh, the next slide kind of let's talk about quickly about what is the difference between an extrovert and introvert so um, extrovert is somebody kind of these this kind of gives you um, a good summary of some of the qualities um, this is not a judgment on one is good than the other 
um, actually, we have, you know, um, a lot of research has been done in the last 10 years uh, to determine that there is actually both introverts and extroverts bring value to a workplace. Um, so this is not a judgment on, uh, you know, who is better, um, but they both have different qualities. And you can see that extroverts tend to be kind of think of extroverts as the life of the party. And introverts are usually, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe talking to one other person or maybe just, you know, sitting by themselves, kind of, you know, um, not necessarily being a loner. They just, you know, sit by themselves or they prefer kind of a one to one or small group interaction. And so the, the, the often the myth that I that I had um, is that you have to be an extrovert in sales. So I wanted to kind of outline what are the pros that, yeah, what are, you know, because there is some validity to that. So what are the pros that extroverts bring into the sales fields, like some of their qualities? Well, extroverts love talking to people and sales does involve because, you know, you are you, sales does involve interacting with people. And, and so extroverts have a very positive relationship with that. And extroverts are also great at making connections. So that could be, you know, networking. That could be, you know, asking for referrals. That could be making small talk, whatever it may be. Um, they're great at making connections. But at the same time, there are a lot of um, qualities that extroverts have that are actually work against them when it comes to the field of sales. So one of the big things is um, extroverts are life of the party. So they end up spending most of their time in interactions talking. And, that, and what happens as a result of that is there isn't enough listening. And as we kind of talked about in the previous myth, um, to be great at sales, you need to be able to um, be good, really good at listening to what is it that, you know, the customer wants as they're, you know, describing their problems and, and challenges that they're running into. Um, and also extroverts tend to be, because they're life of the party, they tend to be too me-centric. And the new dynamic, the new paradigm of a successful sales customer, um, a salesperson customer the relationship is you centric it's all about the customer what the customer wants so these are kind of the cons now let's in, uh, examine introverts um so there are a lot of pros that introverts surprisingly bring into this relationship kind of kind of the cons of an extrovert there introverts tend to be great listeners um which is super helpful in a sales relationship and in, introverts also love uh, are gifted with the ability to think critically and introverts also love systems. And, and if you're working at institutional sales, like I am, um, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of it is kind of rooted in processes and systems that we follow so that it's repeatable. And this is something that you can also bring into, um, your own teaching business, but they're all introverts also come with their own cons. Um, like they, they kind of struggle with, they don't really, they have a negative relationship with um, interacting with people. They like to minimize the interaction that they have with um, the outside world. Um, and uh, yeah, on making connections or like maybe asking for referrals to them, it feels like, no, that's not really their jam. So what we, what I found um, and what kind of what, what has, what is kind of the truth uh, is you want to be somewhere in the middle. And I think for most people, um, I'm not sure. Um, like I, I like to consider myself an introvert in disguise, where I, uh, sorry, an extrovert in disguise, where uh, you know sales or a lot of the jobs that I had pre after class were all about talking to people, and I do love interacting with people, but I'm also an uh, an introvert. I'm a closeted introvert. Um, so what I found is. And I feel like a lot of people could relate to this, that they may not be either extremes, that they're somewhere in the middle, which is an ambivert. And an ambivert is what um, they thrive in sales because they have the best of both worlds. They uh, they can um, oh, they can uh, oh, yeah, they can they can kind of they bring in. They have the connection skills of an extrovert, so they like interacting with people. They, they, they find that to be positive. But then they also have the listening skills, the, the critical thinking skills, um, and the analytical mind of an, of an introvert. And there are, there's actually studies that have been done um, that kind of prove the, the validity of that. So we can kind of go to the next slide. 
um, is, and this is like ambiverted. So this is like, this is a Adam Grant. He's a very famous um, psychologist. He's a professor at the Warren School of Management. And uh, he did a study on this a uh, few years ago where he wanted to find out um, what is like how much, you know, like does being an introvert, does being an introvert uh, hold you back or does being an extrovert give you an added advantage? And actually um, what he found was they both do the same thing. Um, but what he found that was interesting is ambiverts are actually somewhere um, ambiverts usually bring in more percentage of sales. They perform better in sales um, than introverts and extroverts. Um, so how does that really relate to um, how does that really relate to the myth is you don't have to be an extrovert. You don't need to be life of the party to be great at sales. Um, you, success actually lies in the middle. So you, 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 you know, like where you kind of want to create some awareness around where you are based on your personality and where you drive your energy from. And, uh, you know, kind of that, use that as a compass, um, to take a look at your strengths and then, you know, take a look at skills that you can, you know, work on and, and, and kind of blend them together to be an ambivert. And that's where the success lies. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I really, I want to key in on this, the what you said just a minute ago, which is where you draw your energy from. Um, that's always mm -hmm. kind of what I heard as sort of like the classic definition of what defines someone who is an introvert versus an extrovert. Because mm -hmm. for, for me, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, I love being the life of the party. Um, <laughs> but the life of the, but being life of the party can only be done in short bursts and it's draining for me. Um, yeah. what, what gives me energy is being alone. Um, so th that right. make that makes me an introvert. And and I think the other thing that I would encourage, probably most people know this, um, but these things are fluid. You know, like I, I think it can be limiting if you say I am an mm. introvert. You know, and and you because <laughs> what you do is like you kind of embrace those barriers. These things right. are fluid. In some situations of your life, you may yep. be more introverted. In others, you may be more extroverted. The things may change over time. So for me, Absolutely. you know, when I was younger, I was much more naturally like an mm -hmm. extrovert. And as I as I get older, you know, I, I tend to withdraw deeper into my cave. Um, right. And so I think it's just important to be yourself, whatever right. that is, and right. and knowing that as a teacher. Just like as a human, not yeah. not everyone is going to resonate with you, yeah. but but by being yourself, people will resonate with you, the, the people that you're meant to have a connection with. And, and this is a, a huge difference between being a teacher and selling a used car. Yeah. The, the used car salesman, once they sell you the used car, you're done with them, right? You don't have to interact with them, but you're a teacher. And so yeah. if you if you make that sale... And you you got to interact with this student, and yeah. so you don't want to. That's a, just an even stronger reason of, of when you want to have a, an interaction and make a sale. You need to make sure that there's a good fit. So by just being yourself, being yeah. yourself, whether it's your introverted self, your extroverted self, your ambiverted self, by not not trying to be something that you're not, you want to have a, a connection with a student that's authentic because you're going to have continued interactions with this student. And if you put on your best sales hat and you 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 get the student to buy a package, but then you show up and you're you're kind of a different person when it's time to teach, there's going to be yeah. like the student's going to be confused. Um, so I, yeah. I, I don't know. For me, the most important takeaway is just to know, know, have a knowledge of, of these these systems that exist, the, the, that hmm. these paradigms are there and to be what is really authentic to you. Absolutely. And I think that I like what you touched upon is, is really interesting is, um, is, is, uh, the, the idea behind saying this is to not, uh, feel like, um, you know, in order for you to find students, um, to grow your teaching business, you have to, you know, put on a mask of being this, you know, this life of the party, this kind of like this extroverted self. Um, that is that is not the truth. Um, you don't really have to be that. I mean, definitely um, to 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 sell your you know to sell your services as a teacher, whether it is a course or a lesson, 
you obviously need to be able, you need to have the confidence to be able to talk to people and to be able to you know, position yourself well. But that doesn't mean you have to be kind of that life of the party that, you know, um, that we typically associate um, um, with pe people successful in sales, because that's, as we saw, that's not the truth. Yeah. All yeah. right, let's go to myth number three. Yeah, save the, la the best for the... For the, for the last so this is kind of the I feel like this is the biggest I feel in my in my experience I felt this was the biggest myth that you are born with a certain skills and as this is kind of a play on Liam Neeson's taken you know like the line that he's, he's he has a particular set of skills so that that it, that it is something that you are born with on how to sell and 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 what I, that's what I used to think uh, pre off the class before I started working in sales here and what changed my mind dramatically was um, this book by Daniel H., Daniel Pink uh, to sell is human he he's uh, um, he actually he doesn't have a sales background he used to be um, the speech writer I believe of Al Gore. And uh, so he spent a lot of time uh, and he has a background in psychology. And so a lot of his books, he's written amazing books. Uh, one of his, one of my other favorite books that he has is around, it's, it's called Drive, which is around motivation. And, um, and so this book is a kind of revolutionized the way I think about sales. And uh, that's what I want to kind of convey that uh, in the next little bit here is uh, this is uh, this quote and it's a mic drop quote and for me it was a mic drop quote is um the idea that people believe that there are natural salespeople that you're born to sell you have your you know you have certain skills that you're born with but according to him there are no natural salespeople because we are all naturally salespeople and so i want to kind of unpack that a bit more is what he talks about is the 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 idea of traditional sales versus non sales selling, and the difference is that traditional sales is, for example, I work in sales at Off to Class, so I am in a traditional sales position. Um, you know, whether somebody is selling you know a car at a car dealership, or somebody's working at a clothing store, um, or maybe somebody is selling insurance. That is a traditional sales model. But what Daniel Pink found is only one in nine American workers works in traditional sales. That is, their job is to try to convince somebody to make a purchase. But what is more important is the other eight in nine also happen to be in sales because the definition of sales, especially in the post-internet world, has expanded where sales is basically the, the activity of um, persuading, influencing, and convincing others to make an exchange. And so that is kind of the idea of non-sales selling. But at, at, in overview, everybody is in sales. And so let's kind of, you know, like talk about examples because that's how we all can contextualize. And the biggest example would be, the go-to example would be teaching. Because if you think about it, um, teaching, you're, you're influencing, you're convincing your students um, to, you know, to basically um, buy into, if we go to the next activity, um, to b influencing kids, like if you're teaching, if you're a traditional teacher, uh, you're influencing your kids to behave in class. Um, you're convincing your students to care about, to be invested in what you're teaching, to kind of pay attention to you. Um, and you're also in convincing them, influencing them to maybe do homework um, because you're because you're influencing them that if you do the work, your, res your results will improve. You're influencing them to do that. Or maybe you're persuading, if you're working with teenagers, you're persuading you, the parents to, you know, you know, buy another package of lessons because, uh, you know, like you, you, you feel like they have improved and you can bring even more value. Or maybe you're persuading parents that, hey, um, your kids are doing really well while they're in class with you, but hey, can you... Maybe, you know, um, speak to them also, try to speak to them in English or maybe watch, uh, you know, shows together in English and you're persuading them to, to do things as well. So that is an example of like non-sales selling. Uh, another example that I can think of and, and you know, we've all kind of, um, uh, we're all very grateful for this line of work is um, healthcare, uh, nurses, 
right? Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, as a, and I mean, sorry, to wrap up here, teachers are sellers. Um, and the same thing is with, um, you know, nurses. Obviously, we have all realized the importance of doctors and nurses um, in our lives, especially in the last 18 months. But yeah, like as a doctor or a nurse, you're basically diagnosing the patient's problem. You're influencing the patient to maybe, you know, if it's a, if they have a heart condition, you're influencing the patient to maybe replace their cheeseburgers for salads. You're, you know, persuading the patients to maybe start exercising. You're convincing them to, you know, take certain medication. Um, so you're not selling them. So, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not, you know, you're not saying, hey, this is a drug and give me money. You're not involved in the transaction, but you're still involved in, you know, persuading, convincing and influencing them to make a decision. And um, so that's basically kind of all to say is that um, and I would be interested to maybe, Chris, you can share how you feel. But yeah, like in, in, in summary, I, I feel like, yeah, everybody is. Yeah. In, everybody is involved. Um, you know, if you're not a teacher, uh, if you're not, you know, teaching actively, you're a, you, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're a sibling. Um, you know, you are. Everybody is involved in. Everybody is a natural salesperson. Yeah. Yeah, this is a hundred percent true. Um, and you explained it really well. Uh, sometimes people resist this idea, like, oh, I'm not mm -hmm. a salesperson. But the examples that you gave, I think, were really helpful to help everyone see. You know, par parents have to sell their children on things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you're yeah. a parent, you're definitely a natural salesperson. You actually have a ton of experience if you have, if you have um, parented children. Um, yep. I, I mean, it happens even if you're not interacting with customers, right? Even if you just work in an office, you, you yeah. need to convince other people to, to kind of help you, you know, accomplish the goals. Y you can't really function yeah. with, with other people in a successful way without sales skills. Um, it's totally. just a matter of recognizing that these things that you're doing, these interpersonal things are sales skills. So, I mean, and, and what I love, this is, this is what I love. And this is really important to me. I, I do enjoy sales. Mm -hmm. For me, it's really important to, to align my interests mm -hmm. as a salesperson with the interests of the person that I'm selling something to. Yeah. I, I cannot sell something that I don't believe in. Like I, I wouldn't be a good used car salesman, right? Unless they were like the best used cars. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. At, as a teacher, I believe so strongly mm -hmm. in my ability to help my students. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I, that lets me sell with integrity. That lets me sell, listen, you should buy these lessons. You know why you should buy these lessons? Because I know that I'm going to be able to help you. I, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that yeah. with, effectively if I didn't believe that my, yeah. that my lessons were helpful. And look, it's the same thing with off to class, right? Like I, I'm not telling people buy, you must buy off to class. I think you should buy it. But mm -hmm. I know that it's something that helps teachers. And it makes mm -hmm. me, because I know that, because I believe mm -hmm. it, because I use it with my own students, I'm, mm -hmm. I, it makes me feel great about telling teachers, look, I don't have to tell you to buy it. In fact, this is kind of the other thing. When, when there's a product that kind yeah. of speaks, speaks for itself, my goal in selling it is mm -hmm. not to convince people. I just say, look, just take a look at it. Take a look at it and try, try yeah. it yourself and it'll work. Yeah, and I, I think that that's totally true. And I think this also kind of um, um, relates to kind of what we talked about in the other two myths is is the, the limitations that we put in ourselves is, um, is that, oh, like, yeah, I am a teacher. I don't do sales. Right. And, and, and I think what this myth is meant to kind of... Um, what this myth, busting this myth, the intent of kind of dispelling that notion is that um, they're actually, they are not mutually exclusive because, because nowadays in, in kind of this, the world that we are in, the post, the internet world, everybody is, um, every role that you have in society, you are selling to some extent. Um, the difference may just be that you don't always get money in return, right. um, but you are, whether you like it or not, um, just you are selling. 
Yeah. And, and the sooner you embrace it and the sooner you can kind of, you know, um, and disassociate that false assumption of that you have to trick people. Sales is all about tricking people. Sales is about forcing people to buy something they don't want. The sooner you're able to dispel that notion, the 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 um, yeah, the easier and, and the sooner your teaching business will grow. Absolutely. Well, Joe, this has been so helpful. Thank you so much for taking the yeah. time to come. Yeah, I know. Thank you for the opportunity, and hopefully, this is. Uh, Hopefully this resonates with people and hopefully people get value from it. And uh, yeah, I think it will. And just, you know, just to wrap it up, as Joe said, uh, this is a presentation that Joe made for the team. Joe didn't didn't even make this for teachers. Joe made it to sort of share his experience with mm -hmm. the off the class team. So so he shared this this presentation, shared what he learned. And I said, mm -hmm. I asked Joe, I think this would be so helpful for online teachers. Would you mind coming to the group and sharing it? So thank okay. you very much for agreeing to do that. Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. All right. So for those of you who are watching later, if you have any questions for Joe specifically about, um, about selling and how that could apply to teaching, leave a comment. Joe will be around to yeah. uh, take a look yeah. at that later. Okay. For sure. Absolutely. Yes. All right, everyone. See you next time. Have a good day or night wherever you are. Bye. Bye-bye.